Good morning and praise the Lord. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Deacon Mark Norman from Winning Souls Evangelistic Church. And I'm just here to tell you, this is a church on fire. This is a church where the love of God is present. You need to come down and check us out here at 2322 Mountain Road. Winning Souls Evangelistic Church, where the pastor is a Pastor Ian Edwards, who brings a powerful word every Sunday right here, and First Lady Nicola Edwards also. This is a great place to be. If you, if you need some place to go uh, and you don't have a church home, come on down and, and see what I'm saying. This is the church that, that you want to be a part of. It's just a great place to be. We're on fire for the Lord, and you can feel it in the atmosphere. Twenty-two Mountain Road. Once again, that's Winning Souls Evangelistic Church. Y'all, let me give you about ten seconds to praise the Lord. You can act ugly if you want to. You can kick off your shoes if you want to. Take your earrings and your crowns off if you want to. Go on and give God some praise. We'll pick your weave up if you drop it. Come on, y'all, and give God some praise. Come on. I'm trying to get y'all to help me out. I'm trying to get y'all to help. Can I get some help? Come on, y'all. I need just a little bit of help. I'm trying to encourage my own self in the Lord. I said I'm trying to encourage my own self in the Lord. Don't look at the person beside you. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, praise team. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, in all that is within me. Somebody say all that is within me. Bless his holy name. I bring you greetings from the mountaintop. I'm just playing. That sounded real spiritual, though, didn't it? Amen. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Uh, I think I can come down or something. Something's humming up here, Mr. Soundman. Bless you, bless you. Amen. Uh, your pastor needed some prayer. Amen. Um, I try not to make everything be out to be the enemy or the devil. Sometimes stuff just happens. So uh, when I went to Detroit, the second day I was there, I had this big old, my eye was very swollen. And they said that there was a sty, and some of you all that saw me and still see me now, I still have the sty over my eye. And what happens is, is it puts pressure on my eye and causes it to get blurry. And I only have one good eye anyway. Anyway. Well, ironically, I went to the uh, ophthalmologist this week so they can confirm that it was a sty. About two hours later on the basketball court, somebody poked me in my right eye, and I had to go to uh, urgent care. They scratched up my uh, cornea, and some of you look at, look at me in the eye, they broke some blood vessels in my eye. So I've been struggling this week, and my spirits have been a little down over the last couple of days because I've woken up and I haven't been able to see well. It's been blurry, because this is my good eye, but I have pressure on this eye. And now to top it all off, now my sinuses are filling up. So the pressure of my sinuses is pushing on my eyeballs and giving me a lot of pain. So I ask that you all pray with me. I needed some encouragement this morning. And uh, I think I just played my way on the drums to some encouragement. I just, stay, I just stayed over there until, until something happened, until I started seeing. Now let me tell you the irony about this situation. I'm preaching a message about a blind man. <laughs> Ain't that some foolishness? Now, I can't preach it blind, so I brought, I brought some help, $9.99 from Kmart. I, I brought some help, but I praise God for what he's doing in this place. Yeah, I know some people are, are praying, and we're going uh, to get through this word. Hey, can I put a plug in um, for, um, for Friday night's uh, The Laugh Out Loud comedy show? Wissick, we, um, we have had banquets which we have charged, I don't know if they've been $35, $40 for the banquet, but we are actually charging $15 for a great comedy show. It's your comedy show because it's your church. I need everyone in here and then some to buy a ticket because we need to sell all 120 tickets. Now, I know some people wait to the last minute, maybe get paid every other week, maybe the first of the month is best for you. Between now and then, we need to come in here and sell all 120 tickets. Is it, with, can they see you all for the, for the ticket sales? And she has some as well. 
Brother Carlos and perhaps his wife and also Minister Hollis just go and say, I need some tickets. And matter of fact, I need to buy some for a couple other people because I think they want to come with me. Let's pack the house for $15 to get a great comedy show. And it's part of our anniversary celebration. Amen? It's part of our anniversary celebration. So we're going to celebrate in some comedy. You all know I don't like to laugh, so it's going to be a struggle for me to come in here <laughs> and listen to some comedy. You know, I don't laugh much. Can we give our divas a round of applause? You don't have to have on a t-shirt to get some claps. Clap for those that ain't got a t-shirt. Amen. <laughs> all right. Can I get my brothers to bark for a minute? Brothers! Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We didn't even practice that. That's just the way we are. That's just the way we are. All right, I'm just trying to make it nice and uh, cozy here so I can get through what God has for us today. Let's go ahead and pray. Amen? Father God, we love you and we give your name the praise, Father. We thank you for this time together in your presence. We thank you for these people. Father God, from whatever walk of life they've come from, God, they've come to hear from you, get a word from you, to have an experience with you, Father God. So continue to minister even as I pray and as I speak, Father God. Go up and down each sea and each row, Father. And you know what we need, God. Search our hearts and our minds in those deep places right now, God. In the name of Jesus, Father, do what only you can do by your power. And now, God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, he is my strength, and I believe him to be your strength. He is my redeemer, and I know that he's your redeemer. Let the people of God in this place say amen and amen. While you're still standing on your feet, let's go to Mark chapter 8. Good to see you, Jasmine. Hey, amen, amen. Got a co-worker here. I see you. I can see your hair. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> to all the other visitors that are here and those that went on the retreat. We're going to be in Mark chapter 8. put this in size 20 font, you think it's still. <laughs> and the funny thing is, I can see this, but I can't see you all that well. But that's all right. That's all right. Anybody got a laugh in the house? <laughs> Don't come see me when I get sick. <laughs> oh, my gosh, I'm here. Mark 8, 22 through 26. If you have it in your Bible, say amen. If you need Help say, hold up. I like that. Jesus. Mark 8, 22 through 26. It says, they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. That's touching by itself. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes, and don't focus too much on that, and put his hands on him, y'all know how you are. <laughs> but Jesus doing spitting on people. So derogatory. He, Jesus nasty. Jesus asked, after he spit in his eye, do you see anything? No, I see spit, Jesus. <laughs> he looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. But once more, there were two touches. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, don't even go into the village. And where I want to preach from today is parked in between the two touches. I don't even know if this has been preached anymore, but I'm going to preach from the title, I'm Still Here. You won't see it right away, but I'll show it to you. It's in between the two touches. I'm still here. You can take your seats. And I can't jump right to, to where I need to. Groundwork, and if you see your neighbor dozing off, say, Pastor's laying some groundwork. Wake up. Amen. Amen. 
One of the main scriptures that we quote in church circles that really drives home the regenerative work of Christ is 2 Corinthians 5.17. And it says in that scripture that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed and the new has come. And the truth is that theologically and spiritually, this change has taken place. It's real, it's powerful, and it is the start of our journey to conforming into the likeness and image of God. Now, because it is a journey and a process, this means that it is possible that we can be reborn in Christ, but not look like Christ immediately. As a matter of fact, we can all make it personal and testify that for years, we never really looked like the God that we said yes to. The God we visited in prayer only when we, were, when we ate or were in trouble. The God we worshiped only when we went to church once in a while and praised mostly when things seemed to be going well in our life. In other words, we had his lineage, but not his likeness. But it makes us no less a Christian. We just know we have a lot of work to do and that God is not done working on us. And this is why Christians or church folks, if you will, have to be careful about being so quick to put their mouth on people because they're not at a place in Christ that they feel that the individual should be at the speed they want and having the results that they want to see. Sometimes we say things like, if you were really saved, then you would stop talking like that. Or if you were really saved, you would stop acting like that. And we get ourselves all worked up to the point that we're not walking in love. We're filled with anger and we try to act like it's okay because we say it's all about the kingdom. But if those super saints would think about that for a minute, they would realize that the kingdom wouldn't want them beating up on people because they haven't grown to the standard or at the place that they feel they should. But would take time to say, I'm going to love them as long as it takes because it took me a minute and God still loved me. I think I'm in the house. In fact, that's why Jesus had to come. Because sin had me so bound that I was never going to turn around. But the love of Christ dying on the cross, when I accepted it, he did what he did. He picked me up and turned me around. And may I not be, and I may not be what I want to be, but I thank God that I'm not what I used to be. So now if we understand this, why do we expect people to change overnight? Get rid of the habit that same hour and drop their old habits and behaviors immediately. We get so pushy and we get so judgmental and forceful that we push them out the church. And sometimes they even consider giving up on God because the God we show them by our actions isn't the one that they said yes to in the first place. They said yes to a God that sent Jesus to die while they were dirty and knew they would be in a fight. So instead of us fighting against them, we ought to be fighting with them and interceding with prayers for their struggles. Sending up praise to break up the atmosphere that causes them to succumb to the old man and use God's word to speak life into them so that they understand that the best is yet to come. Because this type of response is a biblical one. In fact, Galatians 6.1 says that if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Then it says, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. I'm hating these right now. I'm going to do my best. In other words, it is certain that as believers, we will sin. We will transgress may take two steps forward and then one step back. We may be going hard for Jesus one minute and find ourselves in a backslidden state the next minute. But regardless of the transgression, the treatment is still the same. Those that are spiritual should be full of love. They ought to be full of compassion and prayer, ready to set that person back in place like a broken bone so that God can continue to heal them. I'm coming. I promise I am. Because while some of us may want to look and point and talk about what we would never do, the reality is that there are some things that we would do if the right temptation came our way. I know I just came down somebody's street. I didn't parked on your block, and I'm selling tickets to the show. So it might behoove us to extend grace and mercy to someone else. Because there may come a time when we will need that same grace and mercy extended to us. 
So we don't get our and on our high horse shouting about how holy we are as Christians and giving the gas face to those that don't seem to be as holy as us yet. Y'all remember that because Romans 12, 3 tells us not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now we must understand that the reason why that individual who is in Christ but not fully delivered is still hanging around is the reason why we keep hanging around. The reason they're in church is the same reason why we're in church. The same reason they press is the same reason why we press. And that's that though God has touched us and changed us, we still realize that it's going to take many more times of him touching us, influencing us, and having deeper experiences with us to get us to where he wants us to be. So can we all just agree that that's why I'm still here? I could have been satisfied with what God did, and even though I know he wasn't done, lied to myself and kept it moving, but I'm here because I won't be satisfied until I'm totally clean, till my mind is completely transformed, till cuss words stop being a second language to me, till my mannerisms line back up to the gender that God created me to be, till my attitudes and my behaviors look like Christ. That's why I'm still here here. I know you wish I would have got it together a long time ago, but I'm a lot better than I was. So can you just be excited that I'm still here? Can you just celebrate the miracle that I am? Because there were those that didn't want to see me make it and demonic forces that sought to take me out. But before they could take me out, God brought me out and I'm here and I ain't going nowhere until I get everything that God has in store for me. Touch somebody beside you and say, I'm still here. Oh, isn't that what's going on in the text? You might not see it right way, but I'm going to show it to you here in just a little minute. We're just going to take a little road, a little journey up until what I'm talking about. Amen. The first thing I like about the text is there's some people that brought the blind man to Jesus. <laughs> some, <laughs> there's some people that brought this man to Jesus. And what you need to take from this is that somebody brought you before Jesus. Oh, that's good right there. Somebody took on your burden. Somebody interceded on your behalf. Again, somebody brought you to Jesus. Now, when I read this part of the text, I immediately began to shout in my spirit because I realized that I am where I am because someone brought me to Jesus. In other other words, I am the product of some behind-the-scenes intercessory prayer and fasting, the type of intercession that says I'm going to spend all night in prayer for someone else's hang-up and hiccups. I'm going to turn my plate down for someone else's struggles. I'm going to stop acting, watch this, like I don't see what that person is dealing with because it's not my issue and have enough compassion to say if God can deliver me, he can deliver them too and start bombarding barding heaven on their behalf. And and see, this is the type of selfless service that seems to be lacking in the church today. We say we want to see the kingdom enlarged, our communities change, and our family members delivered, and more of our members being fully sold out to God, but yet we stop bringing people before Jesus. We don't want to pray longer than a few minutes. We don't want to do it if it doesn't have an advantage for us. We get apprehensive, watch this, if the sin is on our top five list of sins that God will forgive but we don't really want to forgive and we are okay with that come on everybody got a little prejudice in them as it relates to sin this one is worse that one is worse that one is worse what about your sin somebody may look at what you have and say what about your sin and here are some people in the text that take on the burden of the blind man and beg Jesus to heal him when was the last time you begged Jesus to heal someone When was the last time you bombarded heaven on somebody else's behalf? Not thinking about yourself one minute and say, I got to bring this person before Jesus. It's not that everything is going great in my life, but that person there, that person needs a touch from Jesus. I already know him for myself. I'm already saved, but that person needs to be brought to Jesus. When was the last time you begged Jesus on somebody else's behalf? 
Don't you realize we don't have to get the person to church for the work to start? But we bring them before Jesus every time we bow our heads and get on our knees. When we rally up in a circle on one accord and open up our mouths and say, God, I need you to touch this person. And God, I need you to touch that person. You start calling out names and you start calling out issues and believe that as you say it, God is right there waiting to touch them. In fact, you wouldn't even be where you are had somebody not called on Jesus on your behalf. I've said this before and I'll say it again. The person that ought to get the accolades and praise outside of God in your walk is not the person you see in the mirror every day. But the person that you don't see that brought you before God in prayer, spoke your salvation by faith, and continue to believe God's greatness for you even when you don't see it or have some mess ups along the way. I said that's the person that you ought to give God. God some praise for. When you ain't living right sometimes, you mess up a little bit and you don't get it right and you have the courage and strength to still carry it on, it's not because you had that inside of you. It was somebody behind you that was holding your back up and holding your arms up like an Aaron and her, praying for you and fasting for you to make sure that you could get to the place that God wanted you to be. Behind all of us is an intercessor. And I'm so glad that somebody prayed for me. The song says they had me on their mind. They took the time. I said they took the time. Well, Pastor, I ain't got time for my schedule. You know, I got a lot going on. I said somebody took the time to pray for me. I'm so glad they prayed. I don't know about you. I'm so glad they prayed. And I don't know about you. But I'm so glad that they prayed for me. The fact that these people brought this man to Jesus means they observed his deficiency long enough and realized that if he was ever to get to Jesus, he was going to need some help. Now, that's the good news being played right before our eyes because it was God who observed our deficiencies and inconsistencies and empty attempts to get to him long enough and knew that he had to send Jesus because without him, we could never get to God. And so that ought to be the posture that we take. In fact, I think we've done all the observing we need to do. Oh, yeah. I said, I think we've done all the observing that we need to do. And we've seen it get from bad to worse. In fact, some stuff is just straight up dead because we've observed it for so long. But just like Jesus called Lazarus out, I think that we too can start calling some stuff out by name and watch it be resurrected and restored right before our very eyes. And we can't worry about how long it's taken or how bad it looks because even when we can't deal with it or don't want to deal with it doesn't mean that God doesn't want to. We've got to get the people to Jesus. Let me say that again. Even if you don't want to deal with it or can't deal with it, at least start bringing the individual to Jesus. There is some hurt out there that is waiting for your help so that they can get healed. In other words, this is your equation for the day. Hurt plus help equals healed. Hurt plus help equals healed. God is looking for some intercessors and some burden bearers to rise up and get people to Jesus. I said they brought the man to Jesus, right? They'd observed his deficiency for a long time and said, we've got to get this man to Jesus. They bring the man to Jesus, but Jesus brings the man out. Woo. I like that. We're almost done. They bring the man to Jesus, but Jesus brings the man out. Somebody say, Jesus brought me out. So now the man has been brought to Jesus, and Jesus takes him out of his current situation from all those that knew him blind and others that had the same condition as him and brings him into his presence. So Jesus pulls him out, and he brings the man into his presence. And can I just say that that's the good news for the person that looks around at where they are and thinks that God has forgotten about them because they don't see him moving. You need to know that God sees where you are and what you're going through, and you may just be the move of God in your circumstance so that when God is done with you, you can go back and tell others that God is near, and yes, he still does save. Oh, that should have shouted you. I just told you while you're waiting for God to move somewhere else, you might be the move of God in your situation. Oh, y'all not shouting right over that. You might be the move of God in your situation. I think y'all going to get it in a minute. Is the yellow bus outside? 
Are the helmets on it, Deke? Let's go. <laughs> now, to bring the blind man out means that what he depended on up until this point had now been discarded. And the only person he can depend on is Jesus. Stop laughing at the bus. You'll be the first one on it. <laughs> he doesn't know how long he will be away. And Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to heal you, so come with me. He just leads him out of the city. So basically, there must be some understanding by this man that his life is going to change for a period of time because he is away from what he knows, needs, and is used to. Are y'all with me? But because he has undoubtedly heard about Jesus and all that he has done, he is willing to trust Jesus with his life and worry about the rest later. And see, this is what God does to get us to the point of saying yes to him. He grabs hold of us and leads us out of our situation, and we know it has to be God because we are willing to go and worry about everything else later. I don't know about you, but that's what he did for me. Most of us had already heard what Jesus had done for those around us, so we had nothing to lose when God created a situation for revelation, and it was just us and now Jesus. And can I help the unsaved person out by saying, you may be feeling a tugging on your heart from God and feel different about the things that you do and the behaviors that you have. Well, what you are feeling is God pulling you out so that he can have some one-on-one -on -one time with you. That ought to help the unsaved person. He knows, God knows that once you experience him without the noise and cares of your environment, that you will make a decision to serve him. Oh, God knows it. That's why he has to tug on your heart, and then he has to pull you out so that you can spend some time with him. I'm trying to preach, Greg. I know you're going to help me in a minute. We all right? So Jesus takes the man out of the town. I believe that Jesus had to bring the man out because he was concerned about how the man would react to what he saw after he healed him. He didn't want the man looking around and being more excited about what he could see and get into, but wanted him to be excited about who blessed and gave him the ability to see in the first place. I'm preaching. So that when he goes back into his old surroundings, he will remember what God did for him and what that experience was like. And reflecting on a God experience is a great way to ground you. I say reflection is a great way to ground you because even if the man stumbled into something that wasn't like Jesus, he would never be satisfied because nothing would be able to compare to the experience that he had with Jesus. Is there anybody here whose experience coming to Christ was so profound that though you tried other things, it was nothing like that first high that you got on Jesus? And now you're at a place in your life that rather than manufacturing stuff and trying to say it's God, you start getting back to some spiritual discipline so you can start manifesting what is God and be satisfied with what he's doing in your life. I knew you was going to do that. But I believe Jesus also calls him out because of the unbelief of the city. And also because some of the people who knew the man would have thought, this is church folks, would have thought it was their mere words and pushy behavior that brought out his healing. As if somebody running their mouth all the time about what you need to do and what you need to change and how you need to get it together will make the difference in your life. That's what church folks do. They ain't trying to bring you before Jesus. They ain't trying to go nowhere and pray. But sometimes they got to keep their mouth on you in hopes that you would change. When you're going to stop listening to that music, when you're going to stop smoking, when you're going to stop doing this, when, when you're going to stop bothering me to go pray for me. <laughs> it, it was me listening to Jesus that got me here. So I need Jesus to carry me on. I don't need hearing your voice. I don't need your arguments. I don't need your anger. I don't need you looking me up and down. I need you to look to the heavens and pray to God that I'll get it right. In fact, when I look at you, you ain't got it all together. So don't think because your stuff don't look like mine, you better than me. He called you out the same way he called me out. You got the same word that I got. You got the same blood that I got. So leave me alone. Clear some shoes in your closet and go pray for me. I felt something right there. I think something broke, Pep. Something broke. 
But he takes the man out so that there's no way that they could get the credit for what God did. And when he comes back totally healed, they would have to say that this was the work of the Lord because only Jesus could have turned this mishap into a miracle. Oh, that's everybody in this room. Only Jesus could have turned this mishap into a miracle. It wasn't what you said. It wasn't how you looked at me. It wasn't what you did. Mama, I thank you for the spankings, but it wasn't even that. It was Jesus that turned this mishap into a miracle. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of your parents wanted to beat you saved. They can't do it. Jesus got to do it. <laughs> Show your scars. Show your scars. And see, I believe that that's all of our testimony. And it's that it's all because of Jesus that we are here. We used to sing that. He brought us out, he saved our soul, and he made us whole. It's all because of Jesus that we are here. Somebody give God some praise. Oh, yeah. Y'all ready to wrap this up? I'm running low on paper. We got to go. We got to go. <laughs> you must go, right, Mike? Now, now here, here's the part. Here, here's the part. We're about to get to the part. I just had to lead y'all up to it. Here's the part. So the man gets brought to Jesus, and then Jesus brings the man out. And the man, and Jesus touches the man. Somebody say, he touched me. He touches the man. Now, this is the part of the story that is the reason why God wanted me to preach this message. God didn't just want me to focus on the first and second touch, but the fact that the man knew he needed to be touched again and stayed to be touched again. He stayed to be touched again. I'm coming. Jesus first spits on the man's eye and then lays his hands on him. While the method itself may have been insulting, it was not the man who was insulted but the disease or sickness behind the blindness of the man that was insulted. I'm coming. I'm coming. Jesus didn't spit recklessly on the man, but his focus was on the blindness. And after he insulted the blindness, he would lay his hands and pray for healing to validate that it is he who has the power to cure all manner of sickness and disease. I feel the Holy Ghost up in here. Jesus in the text makes the strategy, plot, and plans of the enemy feel stupid, forever trying to hinder the plans of God over those that he has already predestined to redeem. Now, it's easy to fight an enemy that has been insulted and made to feel stupid, like that blindness and stuff, because the only way to resolve is for him to prepare for TKO. That's the only thing that the blindness could do was prepare for TKO. After you've been dismantled and after you've been insulted and you don't know what else there is to do, the only thing that you can do is stand there and take the TKO. I'm talking to the enemy in your life. After God has insulted him and dismantled him and the plans, the weapons that have been formed against you that will not prosper. The only thing that the enemy can do is stand there and prepare for a TKO. Y'all better get this. This is not just about the man. This is about you too. All he can do is prepare for a TKO. And that's what Christ does is he gives that blindness a knockout. And that's why the enemy keeps bothering us, because when Jesus conquered the grave, he disarmed the powers and authorities. The Bible says he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And all he has to do is touch us to prove to the enemy that all power is still in his hand. What did I just say? He dismantles the powers, and then all he has to do is touch us and prove to the enemy I got that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. All power is in my hand. After the first touch, Jesus asked the man if he sees anything. And the man says that he sees people walking around like trees. So Jesus touches him again. And this time the man's vision is totally restored and he sees everything clearly. 
Now, this was the first miracle that Jesus performed that was gradual in nature. And it teaches us a lesson about how God works in us when we make a decision for Christ. This is where this message is going. And this is what God wants me to draw our attention to. While we are so quick to judge what we see in other people in the church, we ought to be happy that they're still here. In between the two touches from Jesus, the man could have left and went back. Happy about what Jesus did, excited to have some resolve to his situation, but instead he stayed for another touch. And this is the message for the one who is still here because they know they need another touch. It's not that you don't know Christ. It's not that when you got saved, you weren't serious and didn't count up the cross. You just got some stuff in you that you were deep into that you dealt with for a long time. And God has touched you and he sees you changed. But you know that in order for you to be completely changed, you got to say, where can you continue to be touched? You got to stay so that you can continue to be touched because God is never satisfied with us staying where we are because in him is always better. It's always higher. It's always brighter. It's always much more and more and more. If God is more and more, why does he want you to stay where you are? He's the one that has exceedingly abundantly wrapped up in him. So you're here because you recognize that you need more. I'm coming home. God is not satisfied till you get your total deliverance. See, at the hospital, depending on the type of illness, we want to see patients cured before they leave. But even if we have to discharge them, there is ongoing treatment by way of instructions, medications, and a connection with the hospital to ensure that if there are complications, that there is a way to resolve them. And God is saying this. God is saying that as a church, we need to do better at the business of ongoing treatment. We watch people get touched by God and get saved and get all bent out of shape when we continue to see the symptoms. We point at the symptoms, gossip about them, and sometimes keep a distance instead of realizing that God has made us a part of his ongoing care plan. And as extensions of the hand of God, we can see people get to where God wants them to be when we keep touching them. We touch them with an I love you. We touch them with an I'm praying for you. We cry when they cry. We rejoice when they rejoice. We extend a hand when they stumble and remind them of who they are in God. I'm talking to the church. They are crying out to God. And the church saying, I'm still here. I know I need more, and I'm ready for more. Touch me, God. Fill me, God. Free me, God. Restore me, God. Deliver me, God. Break me, God. Consume me, God. That's the reason why I am still here. I know what I need, but does the church realize what I need? If they did, they would participate in God's ongoing care plan for my life. I'm here because I know exactly what I need. The fact that they are here is because they need God, and they are saying that God is the only one that can give them exactly what they need. So can we be honest and admit that we are all in some way, shape, or form a part of the I'm still here ministry? And while we are looking for God to continue to touch us and do more in us, we're going to help God to continue to touch those that are standing broken, those that are standing fallen and hurt, looking for the next touch from God, because the touch might be from you. I, I, all I want to do this morning is encourage some saints that are still here. Somebody say, I'm still here. I want to encourage some saints that are still here to stay where you are. You may come with alcohol coming out your pores, but at least you're still here. You may come with cigarette smoke in your clothes, but at least you're still here. You may come still with some homosexual tendencies. I don't care. At least you're still here. You may come still fornicating because you can't get past that single lifestyle, but I'm glad that you're still here. You may come battling all types of addictions, I don't even care. I'm just glad that you're still here. You need to know that God is not through with you left. Never feel embarrassed or question what you're doing in the house of God or in the presence of God because you're not 100% clean. 
You ain't got to come in here and apologize to nobody because you ain't there yet. Lift up your hands and praise the Lord. You worship like everybody else. You read the words like everybody else. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm part of God's care plan. Anybody in this house with me? God has called us to touch people that are still here. We got to touch them because they're still here. Who are we to look at somebody like, what are you doing here? Oh, it's you again? Yeah, I need another touch. I smell something on them. At least they here. I smell something on you too. It may not be alcohol, but something stink. I think it's your attitude. He knew what he saw when he got touched. These people know how they feel when they get touched, but they are here because they need more. Y'all better give God some praise. Sit down. Let me tell you how this message came about. I was with a pastor at the conference. We had like spirits, like compassion for God's people. And, and just like me, he's a fighter for justice. I fight for justice all day long. And somehow we got on the subject of homosexuality and how people are talking about this and that and that's going on in the church. And I said, well, you know what? <laughs> and I'll just use a man. If a man was in a homosexual lifestyle for a while and God touched him, I'm talking about he poured out his heart to God. He's truly saved. And during the time that he was a homosexual, he walked a certain way, held his hands a certain way. Just because now that God has touched him doesn't mean that that changes right away. He could be good and saved and still stand like this. He may still switch a little bit. But if he's coming in the house of God, that's right. At least he's in the house. At least he knows that God has touched me. And I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I'm going to keep walking till this looks like this. Oh, y'all not feeling me. But that won't happen if we always got a point at it. Let me tell you something about your pastor who's very observant. I can see a crater on the side of your face from a mile away. And some of the other saints might look and point. Let me tell you something about your pastor. You would never know that I saw it because I would cover it. I would love it anyway. I'd show compassion. This is your pastor. I would show compassion for it because one day after all of that covering and all of that love, that thing is going to go down and we won't see it anymore. And that's how the people of God need to learn how to be. Not why are you here, I'm glad you're here. And keep on coming, because God has more for you. Try encouraging somebody and stop beating people down and pushing people out to church. People coming to God and they leave saying there is no God. Who are you? You ain't nobody, you ain't that good. I promise you, if I get a video camera, get a private detective to follow you, I guarantee you, you're not as good as you think you are. I'm not here just because I'm the pastor and I got to preach. I'm here for the same reason as everybody else. He touched me, but I still don't see everything clearly. And every time I press my way in the house of God, every time I go home and crack my Bible, every time I lift my hands more and more and more, things get brighter and burdened and start being lifted. The habits ain't the same. The characteristics ain't. I'm in the same boat as you. So let me just say this as your pastor and shepherd. I will deal with you. 
I'm being very serious. I will deal with you if I even think that we have hurting people in this place trying to get it the best they can, and there's gossip and pointing and murmurings going on. Now, I'm being dead serious. I will deal with you myself because that is not what kingdom is about. It's not. That's not what the church is about. And if you think you have a problem with it, you need to go home and pray and ask God to deliver you quick before you come in here and I have to see it. I've said it before. This place has been declared a house of healing. I keep saying it. It has been declared a house of healing. When people used to come in that emergency room, it didn't matter what they looked like, what was wrong, they showed up. Leg hanging off, eye gashed in, they showed up. They never had to make an apology for their injury. We say the church is the hospital, but people sitting up here feeling like they got to apologize for how they came in the church. I don't care if the young lady comes in and her skirt is up to here. If you ain't got a skirt in your trunk to give to her, let her stay here. If you can't do something, don't say anything. And if you're going to say something, bring it to God in prayer. Everything to God in prayer. I'm still here because I need a touch. I believe that you're still here because you need a touch. Others are going to come here because they've been touched, but they're going to get word that this is the place that God keeps touching over and over and over and over again. Won't you rest on your feet and give God some praise? Come on, y'all, shout for your Savior. going to be that church that stands for justice. I'm a church folk, so I'm going to talk about them. I'm sick of church folks sometimes. Sick of them. And I'm one. Such hypocrites. You do all that prayer and fasting and that's how you come out? You sang like that and that's how you come out? You did all of that up there and that's the best that you got? We got to do better than that. Change is gradual. Some of y'all may have things on your list that change right away. I praise God for that. But there's many people that don't have that testimony. Many people that don't have that testimony. And in fact, might I say this, sometimes you've been out for a long time. But because of hardship and chaos in your life, you go back to the thing that you came out of for so long. But it's okay. You stay where you are. Because God still wants to touch you even in that. <laughs> You're never too dirty or too unclean where God doesn't want to touch you. My child could go outside and fall in mud and hurt themselves. Before I think about my clothes getting messed up, I still hug my child with all the mud and dirt on them. Are you okay? God does the same with us. And when I say God, I want us to get to a point as a church where we start, stop looking up. I'm talking about the God inside of you. What am I saying? God wants to use you to touch and to help facilitate what he wants to do. He's going to do it through you. But you got to be open-minded enough. You got to lose the prejudice. You got to drop your five, your, your top five list of sins saying, well, this one was too bad and this one was very bad and this one was completely bad. What is that? It's all bad. All the talking you do about the sin, you sin in yourself. That's gossip. We got to do better as a church. There's some people that are saying, I'm still here. Just leave me. I'm still here. 
I know what I need. I'm still here. And as long as I'm here, I believe that God is going to take me to the place that he wants me to be. The altar is open right now. If you know you need to come, just rush the altar. It's open for you. It doesn't matter the concern or the need. Maybe you need salvation on today. The altar is open for you. Maybe you need to, a continued touch from God. You're saying, God is touching me, but I need more. I just need more of him. I'm tired of the same old struggle. I'm tired of not seeing clearly. I realize now that God has already dismantled and disarmed the plans of the enemy. I want to be closer to God. Come on, we won't hold the time. The altar is open. Maybe you're here today, you're saying, I never received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I know religions, I know denominations, but I've never received Jesus Christ. But on this day, Romans 10 and 9, I confess with my mouth Jesus Christ and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And the Bible tells me that's how I get saved. Maybe that's you today. You're saying, I confess Jesus and I believe that God raised him from the dead for me. You may be here today saying that you need to rededicate yourself to Jesus. Maybe you're the one that didn't stay and you left. It was still kind of foggy to you and you left anyway. Just excited that God did something. But God wants to continue the work that he started in you. God wants to continue the work that he started in you. Nobody's left behind in this. This is about family. This is about love. This is about church. There's no weapon. There's still time to come to the altar. Do I have any more prayer warriors in the room right over here? If you can get a prayer up, come on.